Hi, I'm Miranda Wright, and this is day 77 of our 120-day Upper Room Prayer Campaign. And today we're going to identify things that the Bible says can hinder or even render our prayers null and void. Prayer is the most powerful tool in a Christian's arsenal, but there are some things listed in Scripture that will cause God to turn a deaf ear to our prayers until that we repent and get them right and get back in alignment with God's will. So today we're going to identify the prayer killers and repent. You see, throughout Scripture, every time the narrative of the story changed, every time the flow of events took a sharp turn, it was marked by prayer. Truly nothing significant ever happened in scripture but by prayer and nothing significant will ever happen in the church or in the life of the believer but by prayer. It is by prayer that Abraham communed with God and became his friend. It was by prayer that Moses was granted instructions to free a people. It was by prayer that Hannah birthed Samuel and revived a nation. It was by prayer that Christ was strengthened in the garden of Gethsemane to bear the cup of crucifixion. It was by prayer that the 120 people in the upper room received the infilling of the Holy Ghost. It was by prayer that the early church lived, breathed, endured persecution, and still prospered and persevered in great power. It was by prayer that every great revival and move of God in history was birthed and it will be by prayer brought back into fashion by the desperation of tribulation that the true church will be established in the earth. Prayer truly does change things so if nothing seems to be changing it's because the church is not praying. The devil isn't scared of your plans, his or more cunning. The devil isn't scared of your programs, his or more stunning. The devil isn't scared of your promotions, his or more dynamic. The devil isn't scared of your personality, his is more magnetic. But what he is scared of is your prayers because his are powerless and yours unlock the resources of heaven to do what no man on earth or demon in hell can. Oh, if God's people would pray, if they would stop trusting in the arm of the flesh and the tools of Egypt and pray, everything would change. It always does when God's people are willing to humble themselves, admit that they can't, and start crying out so that God will. This is why God himself said that the answer is, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. In other words, repent, turn away from your sin and abominations. Then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive your sins and I will heal your land. Revival can come in and a nation can be turned to God again, but it will only come through prayer. But my friend, there are some things listed in scripture that will cause us to pray fruitless and pointless prayers. We will waste our breath and energy speaking things out into the atmosphere that God is not even hearing. So today we need to identify the prayer killers and make sure that we are not walking in them. The first prayer killer seems like an obvious one. It's sin. If we are living in willful sin, the scripture is clear that God will not hear our prayers. So if we want to pray fervent, powerful, chain-breaking, generation-changing, nation-shaking prayers, then the first thing we have to do is repent of sin so that God can hear what we are praying. It says in Isaiah 59 verse 1, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, neither his ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquity, your sin, hath separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Nothing is impossible for God. It's not that he cannot hear your prayer. It's that he will not hear your prayer. My friend, if we are living in willful sin, the word of God is beyond clear that he will not hear our prayer. He will hear no prayer from an active sinner except for the prayer of repentance. In John chapter 9 verse 33 it says, Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he will hear. 
So the only people that God hear are those who truly worship God with their life, not just with their mouth. Remember, Jesus said, there are many that worship me with their mouth, but their heart is far from me. We've got to worship him with our life, with our action, living out the will of God. Because if we are continuing in sin, he will not listen to any prayer except for the prayer of repentance. So the first thing we have to do is search our heart and see if there's anything that we know that we are living in that is in disagreement with the word and will of God. That is an open sin. We've got to repent of that. And repent does not mean apologize and continue in it. The word repent literally means to turn away from it. Walk away from it and do not return to it. You have to walk away from it in in faith and the power of God's grace will then come to empower you to abstain from it. So the first thing we have to do is repent. And then second to that, we need to pray, Lord, search our heart and show me if there be any wicked way in me, because there may be something there lurking that we don't even see. So God, we repent right now of any open sin, anything that is rebellion to you that we know in our heart is displeasing to you. And I leave space now for you to call those things out. The word of God says to profess with your mouth and make repentance before the Lord. So acknowledge the sins that you know in your heart that are not pleasing to the Lord as sin and repent of them. And then Lord, we ask, search our heart and see if there be any wicked way in me, if there's something we have done or are doing that is displeasing to you that we don't recognize. We don't want to just apologize for it. We want you to show us so that we can stop doing it. Lord, there are things that rise up that we don't always understand. Offense, fear, doubt, pride, arrogance, anything that is within us, Lord. We ask that you show us and we repent of it, that we might be in right standing with you again. Because we understand that the Holy Spirit will not hearken to the voice of an unholy man or woman, except that prayer come in the form of repentance. And having just read John chapter 9, where it says that God does not hear sinners, but only those who truly worship God and do his will, does God hear, then we come into that place where we have to recognize that another prayer killer is praying our own will when it does not align with God. So we've got to learn how to pray God's will, because when we pray for what we want, we are actually moving in self-righteousness, which is unrighteousness. But when we pray what God wants, we move in his righteousness. What he says is right. And the word of God says in 1 John five fourteen, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. We know with all confidence That when we pray in accordance with God's will, he will hear that prayer. And I always love to tie this in with the verse that says, we know that it is not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so that should encourage you, my friend, that when you're praying for the salvation of a loved one, you are praying in accordance with God's will and you can have confidence that he is hearing that prayer. This is also why the word of God says that the fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much because when we are doing God's will, then we are in right standing with him. We are moving in righteousness and the prayers that we pray, he will be attentive to and they will move the kingdom of God because the purpose in our prayers are to bring the will of God about in the earth. So when we are doing our proper job in prayer and warfare, we are praying in alignment and agreement with the will of God. We will see things start to happen. So I tell you that what and how you pray really do matter because too often we pray for what we want. We pray for what we think. We pray for what our emotions drive us to say. And many times it's causing us to pray selfish, soulish, devilish prayers that are actually praying against the will of God. We have not stopped and sought him to see what it is that he wants done. We need to change the way we pray to instead of coming to him and throwing all of our desires desires on him and saying, God, come into alignment with our will. We need to come before him and humble ourselves and seek his face for what his will is. And our prayers will become effective. Prayer is not meant to get God to give you your will. It's meant to help you to obtain his and walk in it. 
where destiny is. So we've got to learn to stop talking at God. God, do this for me. God, change that person. God, give me this promotion. And we've got to start communing with God. Father, I'm seeking your face and I love you and I worship you. And I need to know what the next step is that you want me to do. Should I wait upon the Lord and praise your name? Or do I step out in faith? I need you to show me your will in this situation and what my place in it is so that I can walk in it in right standing and see your power manifest for your glory. This is why the Bible says that when we seek him, we shall find him when we search for him with all of our heart to seek him. It also says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then everything else will be added unto you it doesn't say pray for all of these things first it says seek him first worship him seek his face ask for his will even within the our father which is Jesus's pattern prayer to show us how we ought to pray he even within that prays thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven we are to seek God's will and pray in agreement with it There may be situations in our life that we need to ask him about, that we need to pray about, but we don't need to just lay those petitions down, though that is not wrong in and of itself. It's not effective prayer. We need to come to that place and say, God, what is your will in this situation? And what do you want me to do about it? Because many times he's going to say, wait. Sometimes he may say, praise me in faith. I'm going to deal with it. Sometimes he'll tell you to go and do something. Sometimes he may tell you to be a witness or a minister or to bless someone or to speak or to close your mouth and stop speaking. We've got to learn to start seeking to see what his will is instead of spending all of our time telling him what ours is. We've got to learn to talk to God and not at him. So God, today we repent of praying within our own will and not seeking you for yours. God, we ask that you open our ears to hear your voice, to seek you daily and hear clearly, to always remember to ask you what is your will in a situation and what is our place and how should we fulfill it? What is the position that you want us to be in that we might be in alignment with your plan and not working in opposition to it? The next prayer killer is unthankfulness. God will not continue to answer the prayers of an unthankful and ungrateful recipient. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. This ties into the previous prayer killer that says that we must pray in agreement with the will of God. And if it is God's will that we be thankful for everything, then this is a twofold problem if we're not thankful because we're not grateful for what God has already done. He will not continue to bless, but also we are out of alignment with his will for us. We have to be thankful in every situation, which includes even the bad, because there's a reason for every season that we're going through. And even when things are hard, we've got to thank him for the lessons that we are learning Because it says that this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit. The scripture also tells us that we should enter into his courts with thanksgiving in our heart and into his gates with If you want to enter in to the presence of God where you can stand before his throne and let your petitions be known, the way to get in is with praise and thanksgiving. So cultivate an attitude of gratitude and be thankful for what he's given you that he might be more willing to give more. We must be faithful in the little before he will make us ruler over much. Not controlling our tongue will hinder our prayer life because that it causes us to misrepresent God and grieve the Holy Spirit. How can he move powerfully through you to answer your prayers in a way that others might see and believe if he cannot trust you to rightly represent him to others? 
One of the quickest ways, I think, to grieve the Holy Spirit is to not have control of our tongue. Proverbs 15 verse 4 says, A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. Perverseness means a wicked tongue, a lying, slandering, filthy, unclean, vile, arrogant, or hateful tongue tongue. It is a breach, which means a hole in the wall. There's no defense. Every spirit is getting in. It's proof. It's an evidence that you're being led of other spirits because the Holy Spirit is not going to lead you to speak forth perverseness. Remember that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So whatever is in your heart will eventually produce the fruits of of your lips and prove where your heart really is. So we've got to repent of not having control over our lips or in other words, a lack of temperance, which is one of the fruits of the spirit, right? If we do not have temperance, we are not in control of our emotions. We are allowing our words to be led by other spirits. Therefore, are we moving in double mindedness and he cannot answer our prayers. In fact, the word of God says that he will not answer the prayers of a double-minded man. In Proverbs chapter 25, verse 28, it says that a man who is not in control of his own spirit is like a city without walls. There's no defense and he can't stop the enemy from coming in. We've got to learn how to discipline our own soul to get into alignment with the word and will of God. This is why Paul said that I must bring my own body into subjection Unless that even after I had preached for all of you, I myself might be cast away. We've got to learn how to humble, submit, and obey to the will and word of God. So that we can pray fervent, righteous, effectual prayers. So God, we pray that you cultivate this fruit of temperance in us. Lord, that you take the coals from the altars and you burn our lips. Lord, that we might pray as the prophet did. Woe is me. I am a person of unclean lips in the midst of a people and a land of unclean lips. Lord, before your word can flow forth from me, through me, you've got to take your coals and burn purity into me. Bridle the tongue because the word of God says that no man can bridle the tongue, but the fire of the Holy Ghost can come and give us a new tongue, one that speaks your truth and one that rightly represents you. The next prayer killer is unforgiveness or offense. This will shut down your prayer life immediately and if you don't deal with it quickly, it will steal your very salvation. We've got to remember as ministers and children of God that we are called to love the unlovable. Remember Hosea, the whole book of Hosea, when God made the prophet marry a selfish, unloving, unfaithful prostitute to show him what God goes through in dealing with those that he loves and keeps trying to save, but they keep running away from him. And God was trying to show how much he loves us and how much he endures and forgives us trying to save us. And he wanted Hosea to live that out. And he does for us too. He expects us to forgive and to remember that we are called to love the unlovable. This is one of the things that gets people in ministry more than any other sin, I think, because that we are called to reach the people that are controlled by the enemy. So when we're trying to love wolves and turn them into a sheep, we get bit repeatedly. And it's easy to let offense set in, but that will disconnect you from the king immediately. He won't tolerate it. Remember that Jesus said the greatest commandment, the one that was given from the beginning, the one that if we obey, we will automatically always do what is right, Old Testament or new. He said to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy mind, and thy strength, and to love others as thyself. And then Jesus upped the ante and said, love them as I have loved you. In other words, more than yourself. We have to remember to love everyone. And in actuality, the word sin in the Hebrew, originally the word that is translated into sin literally means failure. It is a failure to keep that commandment. Anytime we don't love God more than anything, more than ourselves and love others and express that. In other words, when we fail to produce the fruits of the spirit, we sin. And this is something that you need to remember. The ones that hurt you the most are usually the ones that you're called to be a witness to. 
The devil will stir them up to attack you, trying to get you to lose your heart for them so that you'll give up on them. And when that happens, because you've allowed offense to set in, the devil gets to keep them and he gets you too. But when you do what Jesus said, when you pray for them instead and start warring and interceding and crying out for them, then God wins because he keeps you and you start fighting for that other soul and eventually get them in the kingdom too. I want you to always remember to separate the person from the spirit that is using the person. Be mad at the enemy, war against him, but love the person, feel sorry for them and continue to pray for them. Because the more you pray for someone, the more you get a heart for them, the more you feel sorry for them, the more invested you are in their win than in their destruction. If you keep praying for them, offense cannot set in. The Bible says, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath or you grieve the Holy Spirit and give place to the devil. You literally welcome him in. You turn away from God and his commandment and you turn towards the enemy. God will not hear your prayers. In fact, in Matthew chapter 8, Jesus gives a parable to clearly explain this. And he talks about this servant who owed the master an unpayable debt. And the master paid the debt for him, forgave him the debt, and sent him out. But then the servant went out and found another servant who owed him a debt. And he didn't forgive his fellow servant. So when the master found out, he took that servant and he revoked the payment of his penalty and threw him into prison to be tormented until that he was able to pay this penalty that he could not pay. And Jesus ends the parable by saying that God will do the same thing to every one of you if you do not forgive every one of your brothers their trespasses. In other words, once your debt has been paid by the blood of Jesus and you are saved and guaranteed place in the kingdom, God will revoke it. You will lose your salvation even if you are not willing to forgive others their sins. We cannot hold offense. It will not only kill your prayer life, it will steal your eternal life. And that's not my opinion. That is the word of Jesus Christ. Even within the prayer of the Our Father, he makes this clear when he says, Lord, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us. He will only forgive you of yours if you forgive others of theirs. In Matthew chapter 6 verse 14 he says, For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, then neither will your Father forgive you of yours. This is not up for negotiation or interpretation. Interpretation. This is the clear, plain word of the Lord, and we've got to humble to it. So today, Father, we repent of the sin of offense. If there be any unforgiveness or bitterness in our hearts towards any man, we turn away from that. We lay that on the altar today, and we begin to pray for them and cry out for them and pray that a spirit of repentance come upon them. And we even move in reconciliation if there be any way that we can bring them back into the kingdom by helping to deliver them of their offense. My friend, if you know that a person has offense against you, even if you did nothing wrong to deserve it, you need to do everything in your power to go and clear them of it. If you've got to take fault, take fault. It doesn't matter. Do what you have to do to help them to release that offense against you because it will damn their soul to hell. The Bible says that don't even go to the altar and pray or give alms. If you know that a brother has offense against you, go and try to reconcile that brother back into the kingdom. Help them to release that offense. Show them the love of God. If they refuse to receive it, then you did your part. That's okay. Just walk away in love and in peace. But if they receive it, the Bible says you have gained a brother back into the kingdom. Remember, Jesus said, blessed is the peacemaker. So choose to be the peacemaker. Lord, show us if there be anyone that we need to move in reconciliation with, not only to repent of our sin of unforgiveness, but if there be anyone we know that has ought against us, that we can go and show your love and help them to release that offense, then Lord, help us to do it. The next prayer killer is disunity in the marriage. This prayer killer is a little bit less known and it's not something that we really think about. But disunity in the family, especially between a husband and a wife, 
is a hindrance to your prayer life. The marriage between a man and a woman represents the marriage between Christ and the church. If that holy representation is discredited or disrespected in any way or falls into disarray, then God will have no part in it until all the guilty parties humble themselves and repent under the mighty hand of God. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 7 says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with your wives according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. So in this we see that if the husband and the wife that are not walking humbly towards each other in unity, performing their proper roles as a representation of Christ and the church, then their prayers will be hindered. Any misrepresentation of the holy institution of marriage will cause God to turn a deaf ear to our prayers. Now, understanding in this passage that it talks about how the husband is to honor the wife as the weaker vessel. In other words, he is to be her protection and her covering. This same principle applies in all areas of our life in that if we fail to tend to the needs of the weaker among us, this will hinder our prayers no matter who we are because it is disobedience. Proverbs 21 verse 13 says, Whosoever stoppeth his ear at the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself, but shall not be heard. My friend, we have to tend to the weakest among us, to the husband that refers to the wife, but to the wife that refers to her children, to all of us that refers to the poor and the destitute and the broken and the widow and the single mother and those that are homeless and whatever the situation may be, when a person is weak or in need, then we cannot turn a deaf ear to that need or God will turn a deaf ear to ours. There's an old saying that says you can tell a lot about a nation by the way it treats the weakest among them. And if we judge by this reality, we can say that our nation is failing miserably. This applies to a person individually also. You can tell a lot about a person, about how they treat those weaker than themselves. How do they treat children or the elderly or animals or, or the hireling? In fact, this was the deciding factor, according to Jesus, in how he would determine who were the sheep and the goats on the day of judgment, because that the goats were the ones who did not tend to the least of these. They didn't go and visit the sick. They didn't go and visit the imprisoned. They didn't go and tend to the poor and the needy. They suppressed the hireling in his wages. They did all of these selfish things, but the sheep were the ones who did the work of the kingdom, tending to the weak and the least. So God, we repent of any time that we have not set our eyes on others and on the needs of the weak among us. Lord, we repent as a nation for shedding the innocent blood through abortion because who is weaker than the unborn and the newborn? Lord, we repent of not defending defending them. God, we repent of any time we passed by and turned a blind eye or a deaf ear to the cry of someone in need when we had the ability to help them to meet that need. Oh Lord, search our heart and see if there be any wicked way in me and even closer to home, Lord, we repent of any time that we are not honoring our responsibility to tend to the weakest among us, the children within our own home or family or church community, the wives, the widows, the elderly. God, I pray that you turn the heart to start thinking of the needs of others and not always thinking of self. Of course, a huge prayer killer is unbelief because the Bible says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And we must believe that he is God and that he is a rewarder of those who what? diligently seek him. This goes back to praying in accordance with his will. If we truly have faith that he is who he is, then we believe that he can do what he can do and we will seek him to do what we cannot do. We will seek him for his will, knowing that his wisdom is greater and his plan is perfect and we want to get in alignment with it. We want to be used in his story and stop trying to create our own because his story is what makes history. Ours just makes a mess of things. In James chapter 1 verse 5 it says, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask God, who giveth to all men liberally, and unbridleth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, not wavering. For he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea, and driven by the winds, and tossed about. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything 
from the Lord. And we have to understand that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's why it says that we have to seek him so that we can hear him. But once we hear him, we have to have faith in what he said. Because if we listen to every other voice that comes and speaks contrarily to what he has spoken, God will do nothing for us. We have to have more faith in what he says than in what our friends say. We have to have more faith in what he says than in what our family says. We have to have more faith in what he says than in what the doctor says. We have to have more faith in what he says than in what the enemy says. We have to have more faith in what he says than what our preacher says. We have to have faith. We have to seek the face of God until we have heard a word and then stand on it in faith, unwavering, fully persuaded. Because if we listen to every voice that speaks to us, then we are showing a lack of faith and he will do nothing for us. Unbelief is a prayer killer. But we have to understand that faith is not just believing what we want to believe, not believing in our own will, but it is believing in what we have heard from the Lord. So get a word or open his word and stand on the promises of God. So God, today we repent of unbelief. We don't want to be found like the Israelites who died in the wilderness and were not allowed to enter into their promise because that they would not believe you. They listened to every other voice and culture that came to them. God, help us to understand. And Father, we pray that prayer that was prayed in scripture. Lord, we do believe that you are able, but help our unbelief in the areas. Lord, show us areas where we do not believe. Show us areas where our faith is weak, that we might grow and branch out our faith and see amazing things done and lives changed by the power of fervent, effectual, faithful prayers. Lord, help us to have faith and to pray in faith and see things change. The next prayer killer is selfishness. We touched on this a little bit before, but in James 4, it says that ye ask and ye receive not. Because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your own lust. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think God is going to answer the prayers of his enemy? We've got to stop thinking selfishly because James says many ask, but they don't receive their prayers are not answered because they're asking with selfish motive to consume it upon their own lust. They want God's favor. They want God's blessings. They want God's giftings. They want God's callings, but they don't want them for selfless sacrificial purposes. They don't want them for God's glory. They want it for their own. They want the world to love them for it. And God says, if you want the world to be your friend, then you're going to be my enemy. But if you choose to trust truly be a friend of God, then I can assure you the world will be your enemy. So choose ye this day whom you will serve because until you choose me, I'm not answering those prayers. So Lord, we come before you and we repent of wanting the applause of men. We repent of desiring vainglory. We repent of trying to make the world our friend friend and we just come to you and we love you and we praise you and we just desire to be pleasing and to be a good friend to you father and whatever you choose to pour on me that I will walk humbly in obedience with it because I only want to show forth your glory in this earth I want to see you get the praise that you deserve. It's all for you, Lord, all of you, none of me, not to be consumed upon my own vanity, but to show forth your glory to the heathen that they might see and believe. The Bible also says that those who specifically seek vainglory, God will not answer their prayers. We remember the example that Jesus gave about the Pharisees who prayed out loud in the marketplace only to be seen of men. So to this, I remind you that if you pray only to be seen for the attention of men, then the attention of men alone will be your reward for it. God will not answer it. What we pour out for others in the scene should only be an overflow of what is being poured into us in the unseen. It's got to come out of a relationship. We've got a desire to be with him. The time I spend with him is my most cherished time and it has to far outweigh what I pour out on others. In fact, I'm only sharing with you what he has shared with me in the time of private visitation and prayer. My friend, it's not wrong to pray in public or to pray for others. In fact, James says that if 
there be any sick among you, bring them in front of the church and let all the elders lay hands on them and pray a prayer of faith. God gets glory from these things. But if your motive is for vain attention from men and not to connect with heaven, regardless if anyone sees you or not, then you're not going to be heard of him. So God, we repent of any desire for vain glory that we pray and minister to you and not to men. Lord, that we bless your heart, that we seek to be a blessing to you, Lord, and not just always cry out for our blessing from you. Lord, teach us how to pray in the private place where there is power, where there is intimacy, where there is connection and revelation and infilling. Let our prayer closet be a place that is more visited than the stage. Help us to recognize that place where your grace is poured out on us daily and not be willing to trade it for anything. Disobedience is a major prayer killer. Oftentimes God does not speak to us because that he knows that we have already determined in our heart not to listen to what he is going to say. If he has already told you to do something or not to do something and you have ignored him on it, don't expect him to continue to speak. Go back to the last thing that he said and come into agreement with it. Obey it and then return to your praying and you will be connected again. First John chapter three, verse 22 says, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Whatever we ask of him in accordance with his will, he will fulfill to those who keep his commandments and do what is right. In other words, to those who are righteous or in right standing. Therefore, do the fervent prayers of a righteous man avail much. Prayer works. Prayer changes things. Prayer is powerful, but it's got to be done the right way. We've got to repent of these things that cause him to turn a deaf ear and not hear what we are saying. Idols are a major prayer killer. One of the biggest in our nation today. Distractions, idols, things that we are putting before God. In Ezekiel 14, verse 2, it says, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart. Now recognize that God's not even talking about bowing before statues. He's saying these are idols in the heart. They're things that they care about more than time with me. These things that they're giving more attention than me. These things that when I call upon them or try to speak to them, they're too distracted thinking about or seeking out or doing these other things. They are putting these idols before me in their heart and they put stumbling blocks for their iniquity before their face. They're willing to put things in front of them that tempt them to turn away from me, from obedience and from hearing me. They willingly put temptation in their life. To this, what does God say? He said, should I be inquired of at all by them? In other words, God is saying that if you can't answer when he calls for you, why should he answer when you call for him? It says, therefore speak unto them and say unto them, thus saith the Lord God, every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart and putteth a stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and cometh to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart because they are all estranged from me through their idols. Because of the idolatry, they have been estranged, separated from God. The same thing that he said in the book of Isaiah when he said that your iniquities have separated between you and your God. When you put up an idol in your heart, in your life, or before your face, and you let anything take the place of God or time with him or the attention that he deserves to be given, he will separate himself from you. It will kill your prayer life. Don't put anything before God in your heart or in your life. 
Because idols cause you to not listen to the call of God when he comes knocking. Leonard Ravenhill said this many decades ago, but it is still very appropriate. He said, and I quote, So you think you want to pull down the strongholds of Satan, but you don't even have the strength to turn off the television? I would say the same thing today, my friend, only replace it with the phone and the social media and our entertainment. If you don't have the discipline to take authority over physical things, how can you have the discipline to take authority over spiritual things? And how can God trust you to give you charge over heavenly things, things of the kingdom? He said to be faithful in the little and then I will make you ruler over much. Idolatry proves your lack of faithfulness in the smallest of areas and you will never go any further than it. In fact, it will cause you to drift further and further away from you. It will estrange you. It will separate you from your God. So Father, we repent of idolatry. We repent of the idolatry in our entertainment, in our social media, in our phones, in our friends and families, even in people and personalities, in our careers, in our own pleasure, in anything that we place before you, before communion with you, before prayer, before being there when you call for us, before our warfare and intercession, before our seeking your word and revelation. God, there is so much that you want to pour on us, but we never meet you there. You set a table before us and you prepare perfection and we don't show up. We are standing Christ up over and over and over again. My friend, he will eventually get enough. Father, we repent of this and we beg for your mercy and we commit that we will not do it again, at least not intentionally. We will do everything in our power to identify the idols in our lives and get them out of the way. Lord, show us and we will obey. And the last prayer killer that I'm going to mention today is an unwillingness to wait upon the Lord. Because God will always answer the faithful prayers of his children, but he may not always do it in our timing. And sometimes when things don't happen as quickly as we want it to, we get discouraged or we get offended with him that he didn't do it. Or we take matters into our own hands and we mess it up because we're listening to other spirits and he's got to separate himself from it. My friend, seek the will of God. And when he speaks that word to you, have faith in it and wait upon it. He will fulfill his promises to you. The Bible says to seek and ye shall find. Seek and ye shall find. Start with seeking for what his will is and you shall find it. Knock and the door will be opened unto you. But it's not always opened immediately. Sometimes you have to wait because he's doing something. Trust him. Don't give up on the sixth day when he was going to show up on the seventh. Trust him. Don't let impatience kill your promise. Learn to endure with faith and patience and he will answer you in his perfect timing with wonders to perform. Psalms 37, 34 says, wait upon the Lord and keep his way and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. Remember, the scripture says that if you do not grow weary in well-doing, you shall reap the reward in due time. My friend, what an amazing promise. I have to read it again because we're going to close on this note and I want you to grab hold of this. It says, wait upon the Lord and keep his way and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. And when the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. Seek his face. Get a word from him. Have faith on what he said so that you might obey and get in position, then possess the land and wait for the promise to step in. My friend, don't give up at the last minute when he was about to finish it.
Father, help us to have patience in the waiting while you're producing these peaceable fruits of righteousness in us and proving that our heart is for you and obedience. Because, Lord, we want to prove the power of righteousness, the power of the blood of our Christ, that he took our curse and made us the righteousness of God, that we might walk in your righteousness, that by his grace we are empowered unto victory and we will see it if we truly believe it help us to wait until you reveal it in jesus name amen and if you have prayed all of these prayers faithfully and commit to not commit them again i assure you my friend that your prayers will change nations